Turn again to the book of Psalms as we continue our study of these precious Psalms that we have before us. And Psalm 18. Psalm 18. David writes this as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him. So we have David's word, but only we have God's word to us. Psalm 18, beginning with verse 1. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompass me, the torrents of destruction assailed me, the cords of Sheol entangled me, the snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry to him reached his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew he came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him, thick clouds with dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Let us pray. Father, once again, we approach you and we express thanks for the word that we have before us. We uh, so appreciate not only uh, biblical history, uh, stories of David, but also seeing how your servant David, when he faced things that he faced, how he reacted in a way that uh, honored you. And with his words before us, we know that your spirit led him to write just what he wrote. Father, we are thankful that in this psalm we see uh, David's reflection on coming through all the challenges he faced with King Saul chasing him all around Israel, trying to kill him. And just this, this hymn of praise that we have before us. So as we look at these things and as we look to your character, help us to praise you as David did. Help us to turn to you as David did. Help us to rely on you as David did, no matter what we might face. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you recall, uh, this is our part two of this message. I won't go through all the background of this psalm again, but uh, we noted that probably this psalm, as David is writing it, this was at the time uh, after all the events with King Saul were done. Saul had died. Jonathan had died. Uh, after the kingdom was all consolidated under David, it was probably after that, I take it it's even after and maybe even right after uh, because there's just such a sense of uh, rest and ease and praise that we see in this psalm. I, I take it it's probably even right after God made his covenant with David. 
the Davidic covenant. I, I take it this would probably be somewhere in that time frame because it's just such a, 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 a time, a psalm resounding with praise and thankfulness and recounting all the ways that God had helped him and brought him through all the difficulties he had. Uh, I, I, I think this is, uh, oh, what do I say? Helpful. I read it two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whenever we were last in Psalms, I want to read it again. I like one of the Bible scholars, his name is Kirkpatrick, and his summary of what we find in this psalm. He, he writes this, At length, the warrior king was at peace. I even just like that introduction. The warrior king, he's at peace. All the running around. This is me talking, not Kirkpatrick. All the running around, all the fighting, everything. Peace. He's won. The hairbreadth escapes of his flight from Saul when his life was in hourly peril and he knew not whether to turn for safety. The miseries and bitterness of civil strife through which, though chosen by Jehovah to rule his people, he had had to fight his way to the throne. The wars with surrounding nations, which, jealous of Israel's rising power, had leagued together to crush the scarcely consolidated kingdom. All were past and over. David had been preserved through every danger. Victory had accompanied his arms. He was the accepted king of a united people. The nations around acknowledged his supremacy. To crown all, Jehovah's message communicated by Nathan had opened out the prospect of a splendid future for his posterity. In this hour of his highest prosperity and happiness, David composed this magnificent hymn of thanksgiving. He surveys the course of an eventful life. That's probably putting it mildly that it was eventful. He surveys the course of an eventful life. He traces the hand of Jehovah in every step, and his heart overflows with joyous gratitude. The inspiring thought of the whole psalm is that Jehovah has made him what he is. To his loving care and unfailing faithfulness, he owes it, that he has been preserved and guided and raised to his present height of power. That's a long quote, but I think it puts well just the nature of the psalm before us. It's just very long psalm, Psalm 18, but uh, it's just uh, a, a, a psalm of rejoicing. While recounting, we're, we're going to see tonight, while recounting some of the things that he had been through. Uh, it's a massive psalm. H.C. Leopold gives a six-point outline, yeah, six outline uh, what God now means to the psalmist as a result of his experience, verses 1 and 2. We looked at that last time we were together, three Sunday evenings ago. What God now means to the psalmist as a result of his experience. My rock, my refuge, my fortress, my deliverer, all these things... That's number one on the outline. I love that. That's what we went through last time we were together. Second, the story of the psalmist deliverance. The story of the psalmist deliverance. That's verses 3 through 19. He, he starts off the psalm saying, I love you, Lord, and it's because you've answered my prayers. And then we see how God did that. It's going to be in very... Uh, metaphorical language, figurative language, poetical language, the things that we'll see in verses 3 through 19 there. But uh, all in all, what that section that we'll look at tonight is, is getting at is God is just this mighty, awesome God that he is. And he takes uh, David in his hands to protect him from those who hated him and wanted to see him destroyed. Number three, why God condescended to deliver him, David, verses 20 through 24. And then fourth, the basic principle involved, verses 25 through 27. That's where we'll, we'll go that far this evening. Uh, we won't finish off the psalm. There's 50 verses. So, you, you know me, that's hard to get through 50 verses in one night. So, uh, we'll be going through this fourth area, Lord willing, and... Uh, Look through verse 27. So for starters, why don't you look down to verse 3. This will return tonight, the second part of this outline, the story of the psalmist deliverance. 
Psalm 18, verse 3. And, and really, verse 3 is the summary verse of this next section. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Isn't, isn't that just what we've seen uh, in these early psalms that we've already gone through? Not every psalm that we've looked at so far uh, involves King Saul trying to kill David, but many of them did. And, and that's just what we've seen in these psalms. The psalms relate different circumstances in David's life, different people coming after him, different people trying to kill him. And he's kind of expressing what, what's going on and talking to God about it and then calling upon God to help him, to save him, to deliver him. And God did. And that's where we're at here in, in Psalm 18. After all those, that eventful life that... Uh, H.C. or Kirkpatrick talked about, yeah, here he's, there's this peaceful time, and he's like, wow, I, I had all these things happening to me. I called upon the Lord, and he saved me. I love him. David here gives credit where credit is due. God is worthy to be praised. God is the one who saves uh, if you don't remember anything else here tonight, remember this basic truth that David conveys here. Number one, I call upon the Lord. That's my side of the deal. Number two, I am saved from my enemies. That's God's side of the deal. You know, that's God's business. Our business is calling upon him. Call upon him in your trials. Call upon him in your difficult circumstances. Call upon him in your struggle with the enemy, the devil, and watch God work his deliverance in his way and in his time. If you recall from last time we were together, we noted that this all occurred over a period of, uh, I, I think, 20-some years when David was first anointed by Samuel to be king and to the point where we're looking at here. So it's not like snap the fingers and God, right now, he just does it. But over that time, David kept trusting the Lord, kept calling upon the Lord. God answered, God saved Verse 4, the cords of death encompass me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. Here we, we see what I hope as we've been going through the Psalms so far that you realize that there was constantly this imminent threat of him being killed. It was, it was an immediate threat of him being killed. It, they, these weren't light matters that he had faced before this time, and that's how he's figuratively referring to him there. Uh, once David told Jonathan in 1 Samuel 20, verse 30, second half of the verse, we won't turn there, but this is a very vivid word picture. David said this to Jonathan, Truly, as the Lord lives... And as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Just, I'm dead if I take one wrong step. That's kind of the immediacy that is being talked about here in verse 4. Again, in figurative language, metaphorical language. But David elsewhere had even told Jonathan that. Just There's just one step between me and death. It is that close to me right now. Verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Uh, the term called here doesn't, by how it's uh, written grammatically in the original language, it doesn't just mean once. Uh, one scholar notes the idea might be better conveyed by saying, whenever I called upon the Lord, that there's just there, it's not just one time this happened. There's all time, all kinds of times this happened, and we read about them. That's what the Psalms, many of these Psalms are about. David is in trouble, and he's calling upon the Lord. Uh, the following seven or eight verses are David using very poetic imagery to describe our Almighty God acting powerfully to save him. And some of the things, I'll, I'll come back to this in a little while. I, I think a lot of these ways that he's describing God in a figurative, 
poetical, uh, metaphorical way are also taken from the Exodus account and things God did there to bring out that just as God acted to save his people in that desperate time there, so God in his life in not quite so uh, vivid of ways, but God acted in powerful ways to save David when he called upon him. Verse 7. Then, so I called upon the Lord, verse 7. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering. His canopy around him, thick clouds with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundation of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. Just with all this imagery, you can picture the all-powerful nature of God. He, he controls all nature. He can do absolutely anything. And then this is the same God who acts on behalf of his servant David. Derek Kinder writes on these verses, uh, that David sees his perils and deliverance as no less crucial and miraculous than those of Moses' day. To be described in the same tremendous terms since God himself reached from on high to save him. So that's some of that language if you can think of the Exodus account. I, I take it David is consciously looking back to that and how God acted and, and what God did and applying that to his situation and saying, God acted as this almighty God that he is for me, and he rescued me. This is what we see in verse 16. Look down to verse 16. He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. So we have this picture of God in these verses, the long extended section I just read, this almighty God, the one who controls all nature and rides on the cherubs and tells the lightning bolts where to go and speaks in the thunder and just this picture of his omnipotence. And then this verse brings out, what, what an amazing thing. He sent from on high, he took me. He rescued me. Now, this is an amazing thing, that this God who is in control of the universe, in control of all nature, he actually condescended to rescue me. He acted on my behalf, as what David is bringing out here. Verse 18. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, his enemies, but the Lord was my support. Uh, he said in verse 17, they were too mighty for me. We've noted before how when King Saul was chasing him, he had a much larger army. He had the, the people, the citizens of different areas, like the Ziphites. If I say Ziphites, like at some kind of, what are those plays where everyone boos when you say certain things? The Ziphites, you should always think boo, hiss, the Ziphites. The Ziphites were out there and they were betraying David at least twice they did this and King Saul's army and things like this they were too strong for him David had men with him but not not that amount of men but the Lord was my support verse 19 he brought me out into a broad place he rescued me because he delighted in me William Barrick notes about God bringing David out into a broad place, the idea of that phrase. Uh, having space or room to breathe, 
just a broad space, depicts relief from the pressures and stress of enemies and calamity. You've had trials. I'm certain that each of you in this room have had trials in your life and difficulties. and, And you know when that's going on, there's kind of that stress and, you know, it's just pressing in on you. Well, think of David again. It wasn't just trials and stress. He was being chased. He was being uh, sought to be killed by the king. And he was a step away from death in his own words. And, and to go from that to, ah, a broad place. Ah, I have room to breathe. You know, just kind of, whew. that's the idea of this, that God brought me out into a broad place. <laughs> he rescued me. Interesting enough, look at the very end of verse 19. He rescued me because he delighted in me. That to me is an amazing statement. That's an amazing phrase. God delights in someone. God delights in David. David is saying here. Could we say, is this just David that God delights in like this? Are, are there others? David certainly was a very special person. It's, it, he, God made a covenant with him. The Messiah was going to come through David. Uh, there, there's a covenant that his descendants would rule and reign on the throne forever, ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So he was a very special person. Is it just David that God delights in? Turn over in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah chapter 43. Starting in, the, I, I think it's September, it's, yeah, I think it's September, I start getting into the major, in my Bible reading, I always get into the major prophets. So I finished Isaiah, and I finished Jeremiah in my Bible reading. And in Isaiah, when you read through Isaiah, you see lots of judgment, lots of wrath. The people of Judah that Isaiah was prophesying to were very bad. And God not only threatens, he says, the the bad stuff will happen, you will be exiled, and all this. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 4, after chapters of judgment and wrath and telling people they'd go into exile... God tells them this as they face exile. Look at verse 1. Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I I love that. Fear not. They had reason to fear. They had all these chapters of wrath and judgment. And here God's saying, Okay, fear not. It's going to happen, but fear not. And he goes through some other things. But why we're here is Isaiah 43, verse 4, and what God says there to really this disobedient, sinful people, but they're his people. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you, I give men in return for you peoples in exchange for your life. So, not just to David, we see also to Israel here. Uh, Jacob, O Israel, okay, uh, you're precious in my eyes. You're honored. I love you. Don't forget that. You're going to go into exile. It's going to be bad, but fear not. I'm with you through all that. So, it's not just to David. It's also to the people of Judah, or here specifically, God says, uh, O Israel, you are precious in my eyes. That's similar concept to saying, I delight in you. Uh, so it's David, it's Israel. But broadest of all, turn to Psalm 147. Psalm 147 and verse 10. And I think 
we could spend time on this and we won't all just throw out there. There is something to the fact that Israel was God's chosen people. He had formed them as a nation. He had promises with them as a people. It's not going to be violated. Uh, maybe we get back to, well, what about me as an individual? There's David as an individual. What about me as an individual? Uh, one for, Psalm 147, verse 10. It says, speaking of God, his delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Uh, the term takes pleasure in, uh, this is you know, this is where my mind isn't as good as it should be. But I'm pretty sure as I was studying for this passage, this was the same Hebrew word for delight in as the other psalm. If it's not, I'm not going to say that for sure. You can check, check out the Hebrew yourself. No. Uh, whatever the case, it's the same idea at least. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope. Uh, this is sometimes translated in psalms as wait. Those who wait, and uh, like I shared last Sunday evening in our devotional, hope and wait, it has this, this I'm, I am positive because I wrote it here, this has the idea of uh, a confident expectation of good. Those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. So believer tonight, is this you? Do you fear the Lord? And by fear the Lord, this, this verb here, it has the idea, do you, do you have that sense of reverential awe before him so that uh, when something comes up in his word, you, you humbly bow the knee to him and what he says in his word. It's like you say, yes, you're the Lord, you're the king, I want to go your way. That's that fear of the Lord, a reverential awe where you bow the knee to him and his commands in the word. Do you have that expectation of good from God when you think of his steadfast love, his loving kindnesses? If that's the case, then you can also say, in your trial, in your time of need, whatever you have going on in life, where maybe you wonder, well, what's God think of me? Uh, this verse says, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. If that's you, then you can say, yes, the Lord delights in me. He takes pleasure in me also, because the word here just says that these are the kind of people he takes pleasure in. In our study of this psalm, we've seen, number one, what God now means to the psalmist as a result of his experience. I love you, my God, my Lord, my rock, my refuge, my stronghold. Second, we just finished the story of the psalmist's deliverance. And he ends that story of his deliverance where, again, he pictures all these figurative language, poetical imagery kind of things for God. But he finishes off by saying, you did this because you delighted in me. Third, and next here, really uh, elaborating on this idea of, God, you did this, you rescued me, you, you helped me out of this situation because you delighted in me. Now he elaborates on that further. Uh, the third part of the outline, why God condescended to deliver him. Remember what I said the fear of the Lord was that we just saw in Psalm 147, verse 11. This reverential awe towards God by which we humbly bow the knee to the Lord and his commands in Scripture. We're going to see that now in these next verses. Uh, verse 20, turn back to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, starting with verse 20. That whole idea... Uh, without it being talked about as the fear of the Lord, I, I take it that's what we see here demonstrated. He says, because he delights in me. And then he brings out, 
He doesn't use the word the fear of the Lord, but that's what we see here. I take. Verse 20 of Psalm 18. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him and I kept myself from my guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Uh, Verse 18 uh, said, God rescued me because he delights in me. Now he's expanding on why he delights, why David can say the Lord delights in me. All these things, all these things that reflect a godly attitude, a fear of the Lord in David's life. Note here, we always have to be careful with something like this. William Barrick says this, uh, The text does not speak of salvation from sin, but of deliverance from enemies. That's what's going on here. Uh, It's not talking about this is how we get saved by doing good deeds or good works or following commands or things like that. But in these verses, I I take it's an outworking of what else we have already seen from David and what he has said. Uh, Turn back to Psalm 5, Psalm 5 and verse 12. David said there, For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. And that's just kind of what we're seeing, the outworking of that principle here in Psalm 18, uh, verses 20 through 24. When we hear that idea of of the righteous, we need to remember a couple things uh, as far as a, a broad biblical theology. First off, To be righteous, we need to be credited with righteousness because of faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, This is even an Old Testament concept. Remember Abraham, it said, Genesis 15, verse 6. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. He regarded Abraham as righteous because of his faith. So that's, as the Bible says, further develops that concept, we would call that justification, being declared righteous on account of Christ's righteousness regarded as our righteousness uh, by faith and faith alone. After we're justified, after we're declared righteous, regarded as righteous on account of Christ's righteousness, then as his people and out of thankfulness to him, we, we seek to follow his commands and his rules, not to earn our salvation, but out of thankfulness to him. There's now what some theologians would call a practical righteousness, uh, which simply means it's not just we're regarded as righteous, but now there, there's, it's, it's developing in our lives. We're more and more becoming who we are. We're regarded as righteous, now we're becoming that in practice. That's what I take David is speaking about here in Psalm 5 and also in Psalm 18, a practical righteousness. But it all starts with justification and justification by faith in Jesus Christ and by faith alone. Now, in light of passages like this and many others, we'll see in the Psalms, Uh, This connecting of the Lord blesses the righteous and uh, David saying, God rescued me because he delighted in me. And then going through all these things he did in verses 20 through 24 of Psalm 18. Well, I I followed his commands. I didn't go the evil way. Uh, I, I did this and that. In light of passages like this, we can say, Number one, we follow God as believers now. We follow God out of thankfulness for what he's done for us. We we seek to obey Jesus because we know it's right and it's best. We bow our knee to his commands because of who he is. 
But in light of these verses, we do this because we see also God blesses the righteous. That shouldn't be our first motivation, but it, it, it says that in this Psalm 5. And uh, we'd enjoy that. That, that. That's a good thing to be blessed by the Lord in that way. Not in the health and wealth gospel sort of way, but knowing that whatever we're going through in life and whatever trials and circumstances we have in life, behind it, there's God's hand seeking to bless us. The friend of John Newton and the poet, he's a friend of John Newton and he's a poet. His name is William Cooper. It's spelled C-O-W-P-E-R. Maybe it's pronounced Cowper. I've heard it pronounced Cowper, Cooper. However you want to say it, I think it's Cooper. He wrote this. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. You know, things are looking bad, and you're thinking, oh, this is a frowning providence. God is frowning at me. Well, behind that frowning providence, there's a smiling face. He, he, he takes delight in you. He, he loves you. He takes pleasure in you as his child. And because of that also, he will bless you. That's what David is bringing out here. We've looked at what God now means to the psalmist, verses 1 and 2. The story of the psalmist's deliverance, verses 3 through 19. Why God condescended to deliver him. That's what we just saw in verses 20 through 24. Last but not least tonight, uh, the basic principle involved, verses 25 through 27. Look at Psalm 18, verse 25. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man... And we've noted before this term doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't mean sinless. It does mean single-hearted devotion to the Lord. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. Van Gemmeren notes of this last part of the phrase, merciful, that's, Merciful, showing yourself mercy, blameless, blameless, purified, pure. This last part, with the crooked, so these are the not so good people. He's not taking his delight and his pleasure in them. You make yourself seem torturous. Van Gemmeren writes on that, even as God deals lovingly with those who love him, he lets the crooked acts of the wicked boomerang on their own heads. They receive their just desserts. Uh, we can think of other passages and we think of God's grace and all the theological things that might come into your mind. But I, I think of this aspect here like what we see in Romans chapter 1 where the repeated refrain is, God turns them over. God turns them over. God turns them over. And I take it that's kind of the idea that we're seeing here in Psalm 18, verse 26, the second half of the verse, with the crooked, okay, this is the way you want to go? Okay, I'll turn you over to that. You make yourself seem torturous. Uh, this is the basic principle that we see is brought out here of God's dealings with men in general. Verse 27, For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. Derek Kinder uh, brings out the principle here, verse 27, like this, of the humble people. He says, These are the underdogs who meet us frequently in the Psalms. They correspond to the poor in the first beatitude as being those who are in need, and they know it. And we would say they, they're spiritually bankrupt. I don't have anything to offer you, God. I'm just, I'm, I'm at your, whatever you can do, I, I rely totally on you. And with that, I, we'll close with Jesus' words here tonight. We're maybe going a little long. I, I take it they serve as a commentary on the principles that David lays out 
before us in Psalm 18 for how God generally acts. You know, we can say overall, we see the idea of God's grace and no one deserves anything, but turn over to Matthew 5. I, I think Jesus and his words in Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes are, are very much in the same vein as what we're seeing here in this psalm. Matthew 5, starting with verse 2. It says, And he opened his mouth, Jesus, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the humble that we saw in Psalm 18. With the humble, you'll save them, you'll act for them, you'll deliver them. Well, blessed are the poor in spirit. Verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Remember the psalm said, To the merciful, you show yourself merciful. Verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, We talked about to the pure, you show yourself pure. You'll, You'll see God. None of these things here in the Beatitudes are are uh, statements of how we're saved. I take it they're statements of uh, the people of God, those who have been saved, their characteristics, how they will show themselves, what they will act like, things that produce true happiness in this world. Happy and blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Very similar ideas to this last section in the psalm. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the ways that you've blessed us. Uh, We thank you for being a God of justice and righteousness and mercy and purity and deliverance. Lord, as your people, I I think I can speak with a great deal of confidence that many in this room have gone through trials, maybe are undergoing deep trials right now, Many in this room have seen you act in in ways that only you could act to bring them through those trials and difficulties. For all of us, we say, I love you, O Lord, because you answer my prayer. We have not gone through the things as your servant David did, but we have gone through trials and difficulties, and we've seen you act in your providence, maybe in very... uh, Uh, unique and powerful and almost miraculous ways. Maybe we've seen that as well. But you have acted, you've brought us through, we're here tonight, and and you are good. We ask, Father, that we would seek to be those who express our thankfulness to you and our love to you with our lives. We thank you that you've saved us by grace alone and through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, alone alone but that you also are a God who blesses uh, practically in this world for practical righteousness. So, Lord, we'd like to be those who, uh, with the ministry of your Spirit in our lives, those who humbly bow our knee to you and your word, help us there. Help us to be those who wait for you, who hope in your loving kindness who confidently expect good from you. And Father, uh, help us to have that sense, as, as David did, that you delight in us as your people. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.